pick up where we uh, had paused um, last time. So we're just sort of rounding out our, our, our general introduction to disasters before we start getting into specific examples and specific uh, case studies. So, um, so we uh, had a little bit more to go last time and I just said, oh, we'll get to it today. And so I wanted to get to that today. And that is the next level of sort of general thinking about our um, disasters broadly writ is the time over which they unfold <coughs> and they occur. So um, it's very common for, this is an example from a, an oil spill from a couple years ago, but basically um, uh, in this case, this is, well actually let me first, let me ask you guys a question. So you've been doing some, some um, hunting down of, of news stories and all that kind of good stuff. Um, how often are you seeing a disaster versus seeing multiple disasters in the, in the articles you guys are starting to look at, the news stories and stuff? Who's seen like just a single description of one disaster? Who's seen like multiple things related? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think, I think the, the general discussion is about uh, the earthquake, right, or the, um, the storm or whatever it is. Uh, and, and so when we do our uh, just starting to dive deeper into these, these specific types of disasters uh, in the coming weeks, we'll focus on a, you know, a topic, a thing, a, an event, that type of deal. Um, but increasingly what we're seeing is what you guys are saying, maybe 50 percent 50, 50 of the stories or something. It's, there's a thing that sort of plays into another thing that plays into another thing or whatever. So in this case, this was um, an eruption that led to other tsunamis and various things. And then um, the, the, the wave of water washed up onto a um, not well protected oil storage facility and broke into the, you know, broke up the, um, the tanks of oil stored, stored there. And then we had an oil spill. And so, so again, we're, we're, we see this more and more frequently in our uh, heavily urbanized world and heavily developed world and heavily controlled world where we have these systems that we put in place for transportation, for education, for food, whatever it is. And the, the, the initial disaster happens and then we start to see these knock-on effects of, oh my gosh, and then also now it's hard to get people food or oh my gosh, now it's hard to get people shelter or whatever. So, so oftentimes when we will be talking about uh, in our class uh, an event, we're gonna initially focus on the primary impact. So the shaking of the ground during the earthquake or something like that. Um, but we need to realize that there's always other things that come along or, or oftentimes other things that come along that might in and of themselves be categorized as their own disaster, as their own, um, as their own event. Okay. So it, there's also um, how we react to disasters also plays out. And so um, this is a, a measure of emotional highs, but I think a lot of it tracks also our, our, our thinking, our, our conceptualization of a disaster. And so time is on the x-axis. So we're going from the start of the event over on the left to, to you know, points in the future on the right. And then in this case, it's not a low to high on the y-axis. It's a it's a bad on the bottom to good on the top. And I think that, again, I think we also tend to see this reflected in the journalism and the news coverage of stuff. So, so this is in the context of emotions, but it really seems to play out in terms of our, our sentiment, our general interpretation of events around the disaster. So, um, so we start off, and in some cases we have some uh, warning of the disaster. So for things that, that are uh, meteorological, that we can uh, see coming from afar with satellites or, or ocean buoys or something like that, um, we have some type of warning, right? And so we can call that, in this case, the authors have called this the, the pre-disaster, but, but basically like, hey, there might be something going on here, in which case most people are pretty neutral. Okay, yeah, whatever, something might happen, right? And that, um, and that maybe something's going to go on to, oh my gosh, something is very likely to go on, right? And so then people start getting a little bit more nervous, a little bit more worried. Um, 
are my storm shutters secure? Did I did I turn off the gas and you know those those did, did I pack my emergency go bag and, and things like that? So people tend to get a little more anxious, a little more negative as we get toward the impact. Then the impact happens, and the impact itself, the immediate impact, is often very scary and 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 what have you. But usually these are fairly quick things, relatively quick things, and people are just dealing with the, you know, the adrenaline of dealing with the getting away or hiding or, or whatever. And then once, uh, once the primary uh, stressor has, has stopped, the fire's moved on, the winds have slowed down, whatever, then we start getting into that um, rescue phase where we're looking for folks. Um, and that's where we start to uh, get all those stories of the, the heroic firefighter or the heroic helicopter pilot or the heroic whoever the heck, right? And so, and so those are oftentimes very heartwarming and they're very like, yeah, awesome, so glad everybody made it or so glad the, my house wasn't destroyed or, or whatever the, um, the thing was. And at this point, this point we're mostly all together. Um, you'll see neighbors helping neighbors, people that maybe didn't check on their other people in their apartment. They'll maybe go on, knock on the door. Hey, are you okay? Are you okay? So very much sort of a community coming together, which is the norm. Um, doesn't happen every single time, but the vast, vast majority of times, this is what happens. So neighbors that maybe yelled at each other or think that they're, you know, evil or belong to some other political party and therefore they're by definition horrible and all that kind of crap, um, that tends to dissolve away. And people are helping each other, people are giving each other rides, people are giving each other water, whatever the case may be. And then at some point, at some point, uh, that tends to be the peak of people's like, yeah, we really came together, we really, you know, it's sort of like Christmas, right? Where everybody goes, love Christmas, Christmas is awesome, everybody's cool to each other. Why can't, why can't everybody be like this all, you know, all the time? And then people start thinking, oh, we're not like this all the time. Oh my God! Why were such why were such a holes? And then and then we kind of dis- fairly just say so it was a sort of relatively precipitous rise of how great we are and how happy and how how jazz people are. Then then we start on this uh, pretty rapid uh, decline in terms of our um, contentment, in terms of our happiness, in terms of our stress going up and all that jazz. That obviously comes from losing things, losing family, losing friends, losing, losing businesses and all this and that. But it also um, comes from the, the needing something and thinking that, that that helping hand would be there and that helping hand isn't necessarily there. And so that leads to this sort of, we kind of have this, this crash and then we get to this uh, phase, which is these guys have, have designated as disillusionment, which is um, um, all the adrenaline's burned off. You know, the funerals have happened and, and the cleanup has happened, but I'm trying to get stuff back in order. I'm trying to get my farm going again. I'm trying to get whatever it is, power restored to my house, rebuild my house, you know, whatever the case may be. And there are always a lot of hurdles. There's hurdles in terms of just finances. How, do, how am I going to afford this? I, I, don't know, I don't have any money to do the rebuilding. Um, a disillusionment in terms of the bureaucracy that exists. Um, so I can't just build my house. I have to get my permit. But to get my permit, I have to get the, this new thing and the, this new thing. And then the bank says I have to approve it. And, and so all these types of things um, really uh, push a, a general sense of disillusionment. Disillusionment with um, our government, disillusionment with um, maybe our, our church or other social groups that maybe we're not able to help us as much as we want, all that kind of stuff. And so we enter this general phase of disillusionment. And then once we actually start to, to um, uh, get better, once we start to do the rebuilding um, and, 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 and get back in our houses, get crops planted again in, in the fields and what have you, then people start to have a, a, a more positive um, feeling. Um, so that's, the, the, now the, this, the time scale of this might shift depending on, on the magnitude of the disaster or the particular location. But in general, this, I, I've seen this play out time and time again, where we start kind of like fairly neutral, the event happens, and rather than like knocking everybody down, that initial part is positive, 
positive news coverage, positive feeling. Oh my God, we're such good people. We can help each other. We can do whatever, right? We won World War II, you know, that kind of that kind of stuff. And then, and then a sort of fairly quick descent into depression and, and negative feelings. And then this long period of sort of anger and 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 worry about bureaucracy. And then eventually um, to something similar to the the previous stage of of feeling or news coverage or whatever. Cool. All right, um, and so here's just a, 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 and then another thing that is um, an aspect, not only do we have like primary impacts of a disaster and then secondary or knock-on effects, we also have some disasters play out very, very quickly. Uh, the lightning strikes, the fire starts, and the fire burns through our neighborhood tonight kind of thing, um, versus other things that are still a disaster but play out over longer timescales. Think of a famine, something like that. Um, and, and they tend to, while they, they follow a similar overall pattern, um, there are differences between these, these types of disasters. So for example, this is uh, uh, Typhoon Haiyan, um, which was, uh, this is 2013. Um, this is one of the strongest uh, so we haven't talked about hurricanes yet, but suffice to say, hurricanes are just a tropical storm. Hurricanes, typhoons, all these things, they're essentially just a really strong tropical storm. So we use the term cyclone, typhoon, typhoon hurricane for when, when wind speeds get to essentially dangerous levels. Um, uh, but all these phenomena are the same. So this, is, this was one of the strongest um, of these uh, tropical depressions ever seen and it spun up very, very fast. So um, it, <clears throat> and we're talking in the South Pacific now. And so this guy gets spin up and be only becomes a typhoon on November 7th of this particular year. A day later, it makes landfall in the Philippines and it kills uh, 6,000 people just in the immediate wake, um, injures about 30,000 people and move, and drives at least four million people to have to move away from their home. So huge impact. So it wasn't a, it wasn't a, a typhoon, then it was a typhoon. Next day it hits the place and by the day after it's completely gone. It looks like this outside. It's blue skies and it's, and it's uh, you know, gentle winds and stuff. So that would be a classic example of one of these sudden onset disasters. Um, and then in contrast, we could talk about something like, uh, as I mentioned, dr uh, a famine or droughts. And so droughts um, never happen, by definition, droughts are never going to be a sudden onset, right? Because we all have river water, we all have groundwater, we all have sources of water. So drought is by definition one of these longer, things that plays out over longer time scales. And so here's an example, August 2010. We predicted, hey, oh my gosh, you guys, watch out. We got to start taking some precautions. We got to conserve water even more than we already do because there's a drought coming. It doesn't fully, and we're talking about Africa here now, doesn't severely hit the, the Horn of Africa until the following year. So this was you know, at least a year, if not, if you're paying attention, there were indications before then, but, but formally a year of, of preparation before it hits. Um, and then this really, really severe drought with basically no rain lasts for a whole year. And that leads to um, eventually a million people fleeing their homes and farms and moving to other countries. So um, you, we can imagine that the these, these same, these same scale of, of, of like, you know, worry, not worry, scared, anger, all that kind of stuff plays out, but it's going to play out slightly differently on a longer term um, uh, type of disaster. And so this, this archetypal response is made for the sudden onset uh, disasters. Okay, when these things happen, another broad category we need to sort of keep in mind as we talk about disasters is the notion of, of who's being impacted. And to be clear, disasters are, are screwed up for everybody. They are bad for everyone. Everyone suffers, right? Um, Having said that, uh, the, more prob the more intense and problematic the disaster is as we go from an emergency to a disaster and a disaster to a catastrophe, um, there are clearly groups that, that different times, different places, different countries, different settings always seem to bear consistently um, the greatest impact. 
and those are uh, old folks, um, folks that are um, uh, phys particularly physically disabled, that you know, have a hard time, say, moving around landscapes, things like that, people that don't have a lot of money. And then in the case of our country, it would be non-English speakers, but it would be whoever doesn't, um, can't communicate in the local language fluently. So we'll just use non-English speakers as, as the shorthand for us in the U.S. But it's basically someone that can't easily access um, information sources. And or when there's help that comes, the help often is in the dominant language of, of the region of the country. And so those are four groups that consistently always show um, slower recovery rates, higher mortality rates, um, uh, lower rates of getting assistance, um, all of those kinds of things. So elderly, disabled, poor, and um, in, the, in the U.S., non-English speakers. Um, okay. Um, and so, and so those, that vulnerability can take, take place in a, a lot of different uh, um, dimensions, but here's just a couple questions um, that sort of highlight that. So one is, who doesn't have homeowner's insurance, right? So that's going to uh, tend to be the folks that um, don't own a home, so maybe they're renting, so maybe they don't have any renter's insurance, right? So the disaster comes and destroys all your stuff. If you have a home, you might have a deductible and there's problems with home insurance, but at least you, there's something there. Whereas folks that are uh, more itinerant uh, don't necessarily have that. Or folks who don't have a lot of money maybe don't have full home coverage, et cetera. Et cetera. Other examples are folks that can escape the disaster when we have some amount of forecasting. So who can't jump into their own private vehicle, right, to get away? So people have to rely on public transportation or, or some other form to, uh, you know, family or friends or something like that. Um, who doesn't, and this is increasingly becoming a huge thing as we're seeing, particularly with things like wildfires. Um, this was a major issue in the Lahaina fires. This is a major issue in Paradise uh, here in California. Um, those are the two highest mortality events in wildfires in recent years. But, but anyway, um, the idea is who doesn't have a cell phone to get emergency alerts? So we just, in acad <coughs> academic senate yesterday, we were talking about a, a revised policy for how the university communicates with you guys. When um, there's something about financial aid or registration deadlines or stuff like that. But it's also the same policy that we use to communicate to you all when we have an emergency. And so most recently, you might have uh, receive text or whatever about the mountain lion on campus as if like that's a problem right it's like I can't tell you how many meetings I've had with these guys like mountain lion not a problem oh my god but mountain lions is like scary <laughs> so they, they think that mountain lions are dangerous for some stupid reason but um, but really that, that that type of stuff is really helpful for when we do have wildfires and things of that nature all of you or, or virtually all of you have a cell phone right so so when we have we push out that information you guys can get a, a, a ping on your phone or a, or a text message that you can check. Um, uh, in the case, this first really became really, really apparent in the Paradise Fire here in California, which is, you know, kind of foothills of the Sierras, around Chico, that, that type of area. Um, and uh, this, is, this is a town, but it's a low-density town. We would consider it more of like a rural type of community. Um, and I don't want to totally go into that story yet, but... Suffice it to say, um, that town burned um, about 20 years before, and uh, and there was a um, a report that came out. So, so after 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 the fire, after people were you know back and everything, they hired a consulting firm and they said, "Hey, help us understand like our risk and what we should do if another fire comes through." And they basically said, uh, "You're screwed. The the way the town is built and the the number of people that are there." It's, it's not possible to get everybody out instantly because there's limited, uh, limited ingress and egress in this particular region. Uh, so they said, what you need to do is you need to build more roads. And the town's like, oh, that's too expensive. Or, or limit the number of people, you know, cap the number of residences, the number of buildings. Like, oh, we don't want to do that. And, da, 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 da. and so um, the decision was made to divide the city into fourths. So paradise would be one-fourth here, one-fourth here, one-fourth here, one-fourth here. And if we have an emergency, we'll first ask the people in Section A to evacuate. And then an hour or whatever the heck later, we'll ask people in Section B, in Section C, in Section D. 
And everybody thought, yeah, okay, that makes sense, cool. And that was the plan, essentially. And so um, problems with that, one, you have to have everybody that knows that's the plan, right? Which, and and this, this was, by and large, a, a larger sort of more retired community, right? This was more folks that kind of want to live in the nice place but, but um, couldn't afford to live in a you know, fancy city or something like that. So, so it was mostly elderly folks. They didn't all have cars. But importantly, um, they didn't all have landlines. And so because they didn't all have landlines, uh, uh, a lot of folks didn't have cell phones. And so, so for both those, for, for, for that, that plan to work, there would have to be, everybody would have to be notified instantly. And so the idea would be, hey, everybody in the town, you guys, um, there's a fire coming, get ready to go. If you're, and then call the people in, in area A and say, you guys got to go now. And then an hour later, call the next guys and say, you guys got to go now so that the roads wouldn't clog up. Uh, and, the, and the, there wouldn't be um, a bottleneck on the roads. That did not work at all. Um, uh, and, and one of the things people said was, which, is, which we hear commonly, unfortunately, in these, in these situations, and this is one of the major current uh, uh, focuses of, of modern um, disaster planning, is how do we get information to people? How do we get information to people that, that don't have... Um, you all are very tech savvy. You guys all have cell phones and computers and stuff. But a lot of our, especially elderly community, or folks that don't speak English, that don't have uh, English language, or can't interpret the English language warnings, that's a problem. And so the same thing happened in Hawaii. So in Hawaii, um, they have a, a very robust tsunami warning system. So all we drive around anywhere in the coastal areas of Hawaii, you'll see these big sort of tall towers with these kind of uh, uh, mushroom looking horns on them. And that's because any, any day of the week, there could be an earthquake either nearby or far away in the Pacific and Hawaii's in the middle of the Pacific. So everything can potentially hit it. And so there's a, a siren that goes off and then everybody's knows, oh, when that happens, go to high ground. Um, in the case of the, the Maui fires, when the fire was starting in, on land and then starting to burn towards the coast, the then director of their emergency management system did not trigger the, the very well designed, very robust, very well maintained um, emergency warning siren, which says there's a tsunami coming. Um, and then that triggers people to turn on the TV or turn on the radio or, or look at their phone if they have one, whatever. Um, that didn't happen because the guy was afraid that the, uh, this is what this, the argument was, oh, if we trigger this, people think it's a tsunami and they'll run into the fire, right? It, I mean, there's a massive, fi massive winds going, massive smoke and flames. If anybody had opened a door, you would have gotten a sense that something bad was coming from that direction. Um, but unfortunately, uh, that wasn't triggered. So this notion of, of communication, do, do people have enough money to have a cell phone? Do they have, do they have you know, all that kind of stuff? And then another one would be um, who has minimal savings to, to go evacuate for a week, right? Who has, the, who has the disposable cash to go get a hotel, right? Um, during the, what was the most recent one? During uh, the Woolsey fire, so uh, my family evacuated, and I'm always in trouble. I'm always in trouble, I'll just say this, uh, in my family, because I'm always away when the disaster happens. So when that disaster happened, I had a group of you all at a conference, I had a bunch of students at a conference in um, San Diego. And so uh, uh, my family was angry that I wasn't there to evacuate the animals and everything. Like, you're never here. But I don't, I don't want to rant about that for a while. Anyway, so they evacuated first to a Starbucks in the collection um, at like, one in the morning or some such thing. Um, uh, the Woolsey fire came through at night. The, the first wave came through at night. Um, and, uh, and then they were there for a few hours and then they went, we eventually went to a hotel in um, Mandalay Bay of all places, which is a super swank hotel. Everybody and their brother went to Mandalay Bay because they were one of the few places that said you could have animals. And so, so everybody that had dogs and stuff was there. Um, uh, we were fortunate in that we had money, right? Professors can uh, can have uh, we have a bank account, right? So we could we could do that. Not everybody can do that. 
So that's another key measure of vulnerability. And then another one is um, who uh, doesn't have great relationships with their family, right? So, so maybe we can't, there's other things, maybe we don't have money to go to a hotel, but maybe we can go crash with my uncle, or we can go crash with my sister or something like that, right? But as people are more marginalized and maybe they're, they're separated from their family because of drug addiction or other things like that, it's harder for folks to seek refuge in that. So all, the, all these questions are really common examples of who, who would be vulnerable and that, therefore which groups are gonna be more impacted. Um, I would say that it's important that everybody needs to be helped. These folks need some extra help, but everybody needs to be helped. Sometimes in the rhetoric, it becomes only about the old people or only about the, the, the poor folks. And it's important to say that in a disaster, everybody needs to be taken care of. Everybody needs help. Nobody is, no matter how prepared they are, nobody is perfectly prepared for these types of things. And then lastly, in general, what we'll see over the course of the semester is that the, the well, we have an activity to look at this, but, but hint, hint, this is what you're gonna find, um, that the number of disasters, how frequently they come, when they do come, how big of an impact, how, how big of an event they are, either in physical space or how, how many communities are impacted, are going up. And that's for a variety of reasons. Um, climate change is, ap so, so when I ask you guys, when I ask people this question, they go, oh yeah, because climate change. Climate change is making stuff worse. worse. Yes, it is, but that's not the biggest issue. Um, uh, climate change, totally real. Climate change causes us more problems. Ca climate change is bad. We should not have climate change. We should do everything we can to avoid it. But the, the turns out the major thing that's going on as to why things are more costly, why they take longer to recover from, all that kind of stuff, is that we have more and more human beings on this planet. So we have more and more people here. So if we look at the disasters 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 50 years ago, there just wasn't as, there weren't as many individuals and there weren't as, wasn't as much infrastructure in the way. So first and foremost, we're putting more things in potential dangers path. Secondly, um, we're changing where we, where we live on, on the surface of the earth. Um, and more and more folks are in, um, uh, uh, and at least we talk about the, the population as a whole, we have more and more folks in our country, we would call them homeless folks. In other countries, we would talk about people living in favelas or slums or other things. The, having people in those types of structures make, make them much more vulnerable to the wildfire, the flood, the whatever. Um, and, then, and then ultimately, um, we talk about the increasing cost and therefore the difficulty in rebuilding. Um, it's just the fact that the stuff we build now is way more expensive. Every single thing we do is more expensive now as a society. So this building, let's just look around this lecture hall. We have some fluorescent lights. We have some, some electricity that's running in. We have a projector. We have a, a, a um, ceiling-based projector. Um, this screen is a mechanical screen, right? I, I don't pull it down by my hand, I have to push a button, zzz, it lowers, right? The access to this door, or the access to this classroom is a computer-coded um, access panel, et cetera. If we had this same classroom 25 years ago, we maybe would have had the fluorescent lights and we would have had a chalkboard instead of maybe a, a whiteboard, um, but then we wouldn't have had, a, the door would have been a, just a physical key lock, right? If I'd had a screen, it would have been a just me grab it and physically pull it down type of screen. So all these things that are, that are cool and are helpful, it, it just, it, that's a lot more compute, computer stuff we have to have, a lot more wires we have to have, a lot more, uh, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So as we, as we make our, our living world more sophisticated, that's one of the biggest reasons why, why disasters are more costly and why they're harder to recover from, et cetera. Yes, climate change is real. Yes, we're having more frequent storms and everything. But realize that the real recovery is about, is about this, this stuff that we've created.